So it's really a pleasure and a privilege to have you guys here. Carlos will do a formal presentation of you, even though I don't think that is necessary. Uh, the, we are actually recording this presentation, and like all the events that we do, the Varandas, it's going to be posted in full at YouTube so that you know about it. And uh, I just would like to quickly welcome you to the Internet and Technology, uh, the Institute for Technology and Society. And I'm going to hand over the microphone to Carlos, who will do the formal presentation. Uh, the reason how we're going to do this is not falling into a trap regarding style. Uh, is at first we're going to handle to Ethan to to give a short like a 20 minutes ish presentation, and then we switch switch to Ivan, and after those two presentations we open up for discussion. So the general idea is to handle this as uh, open discussion with all of you. Hopefully it's going to be a provocative discussion. This is much more than a conversation rather than a uh, unilateral like, speech that uh, any of us is giving here. So hopefully it's going to be a very exciting uh, conversation for, for all of us. Okay, so Ethan, go first. So uh, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Ronaldo. Uh, at this point, I'm going to switch into Bulgarian. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could I think that, that would be good fun. Um, so look, um, Ivan and I are both people who think a lot about this question of what's the future of democracy? How does political change take place? How do new technologies and new trends fit in with all of this? And when I first got to know Renato Lemos, now maybe 12 years ago, there was enormous enthusiasm about the idea that now that the internet was coming into every household, everything we know about democracy was going to change. And we're now at a point, let's say 25 years into the World Wide Web, 20 years into what we might call the commercial web, a moment where everybody has access. Um, and that hasn't happened. Uh, actually, the trend. Um, so in my country, there was huge enthusiasm about 12 years ago that people would run their presidential campaigns online, everybody would chip in, we would form you know, platforms together. Uh, there was a candidate, Howard Dean, who tried to do this in 2004. When he didn't win, what happened was politics switched to using the internet to advertise instead. And we saw this with Obama, who did very effective internet advertising and fundraising, but didn't focus on participation. So many of these great promises that the internet was going to be this two-way space, it was going to open up democracy, we were all going to participate more broadly. In many cases, it's been very frustrating. It hasn't happened nearly as much or nearly as fast as we would sort of hope that it would. Now let me say, because we're here in Brazil, Latin America has probably been the one case where this actually has come true. And so we've had incredible successes like the Marco Seville. Um, we have the wonderful project underway here to take some of the tools used to draft legislation from Marco Seville and release it as a platform uh, to allow people to draft legislation. We have amazing experiments out of Argentina, like Democracy OS, trying to help people get together and figure out how they can do joint decision making. And this may be unique to Latin America. This may build on specifically Brazil's very long history of participatory democracy. But for the moment, it's been the exception, not the rule. And so within our field, there's a lot of reevaluation going on right now. And you see a lot of books where people are writing and essentially saying, wait a second, what happened? For 20 years we've been saying everything's going to change, and things haven't changed yet. So one of the best books in this field is by a guy named Mika Sifri. Um, he runs Personal Democracy Forum. He's a very, very active guy in technology and democracy. And he published a book um, 
called the big disconnect. And the argument behind the big disconnect is that we need a little bit more time, and what we mostly need is much, much better tools. Mika basically says, look, there's two main problems we haven't solved. We're still using email as a tool for mobilization. We use it because it's actually a very good tool for raising money, but it's a terrible tool for actually organizing people to do things. It's centralized. So much of the world ends up using these sort of mailing lists to, to mobilize people. That doesn't work very well. It doesn't work for smaller groups. The second problem that he brings up is we don't do deliberation very well in these systems. So it's very hard for people to get together, actually try to make policy, actually sort of move forward. So Micha's an optimist. He says, look, the internet still is really going to change everything. We just don't have the tools yet. And so he's very enthusiastic about things like Democracy OS. He'll be hugely enthusiastic about the platform that you're releasing. I want to be more negative. And the reason I want to be more negative, just, just wait, you're, you're going to get much more negative. I want to be, I want to be more negative about this. And, and here is my example, which is the field of transparency. We've had amazing achievements in the field of transparency. We've gotten many, many, many governments to open up their data. We've built wonderful tools to access that data, to visualize that data. And that movement, that transparency movement, is now going through a crisis because it turns out most people actually aren't all that interested in visualizing that data. We have journalists flocking to use that data. We see very few citizens who are lining up to use that data. We thought the problem was just the tools. We thought if we would build good tools, suddenly democracy would change. And at least around transparency, for all the achievements we've had, it has not been a radical transformational change. We were expecting that you would look at a year like 2015 and say this is totally different from 1995. They actually look pretty similar. So here's what I think is going on. And here, I lean on my good friend who wrote just an amazing little book that you really ought to read called In Mistrust we trust. So Elon puts forward this theory, and he basically says, look, the problem with politics right now is that you can take to the streets, you can organize a campaign, you can try to make change any way you know how to make change, but you're very unlikely to meet your ultimate goal. And the reason for that is that the people in political power have a lot less power than we think. These institutions that we're trying to influence are a lot less powerful than we dream of them being. Elon gives the example that you look at a movement like the Indignados in Spain, and you say, great, what if we give these guys exactly what they want? You can't cut austerity, because global markets won't let you cut austerity. And so when you start discovering is that the electoral system, the protest system, all of this is trying to push on something that can't really move. And one of the main reasons that, one of the main things that comes out of this is a system in which you end up alienated, you end up very mistrustful, and you end up with a very specific kind of mistrust. It's a mistrust in institutions. And for me, this is the diagnosis. This is why I enjoy spending so much time with this guy, is that I think one of the best ways to describe this moment in history is a moment when many, many people are mistrustful of institutions. So let's back up a little bit. Brazil is usually considered to be a very low trust society. If you ask the question, do you think most people will do the right thing most of the time. I'm going to show of hands, who thinks most people do the right thing most of the time? So it turns out that in the World Values Survey, when you ask Brazilians this question, 7% say yes. Okay? The only nation I found that's lower than this is the Philippines, where 3% is really, really low on this, right? The U.S. is considered a high 
Americans will tell you 60, 65 percent will say most people will do the right thing most of the time. You go to Germany, you get 80 percent. You go to Japan, you get 95 percent. So societies vary a great deal on this. But even in the US, where 60% of the people say most people will do the right thing, if you ask them, do you trust the government to do the right thing, <laughs> the numbers go way, way, way down. So when you say, is the government doing the right thing, you get less than 20% in the US right now. If you ask Congress, you get about 9%. Now, this might just be that we have a really dysfunctional government right now. But actually, there's much less trust in other institutions as well. There's been a decline in the US and in most of Europe in trust in corporations, trust in the church, trust in the press, trust in the government, trust in the civil service. In the US, the only two areas where trust has gone up in the last 30 years are in the police and the military. Basically, the US is turning into Egypt. We think that only the people with guns can actually get things done. And this is a very scary thing. Let's pull up showing that in Brazil, too. So, Brazil. firemen I, yeah. and, the, and the military. Sure, sure. So, so here's, here's the hypothesis. And, the, and this is, in many ways, Ivan's hypothesis, not my hypothesis, but I've adopted it because it's such a smart idea. If our moment in time is a moment where our generation is a mistrustful generation, what do we do? Mistrust is usually seen as being very corrosive, very negative. If you don't trust the government, you're not going to participate in the government. If you don't participate in the government, the government just gets worse. You have less reason to trust. Even if we're doing the right thing, you're not paying attention, you wouldn't know. I think, for Ivan, trust is a huge problem. And the thesis of this book is, how do we have democracy without trust? Now, here's the thing. Bulgarians are not known for their optimism. Americans are. So I'm going to give you the optimistic view. I think mistrust could be a very powerful tool for social change. So here's how. If we look at the world and say, how do we make change in this area of mistrust? There's a limited group of people, some of whom are in this room, who are looking for ways to engage with government, who are looking for ways to pass laws. But a lot of us look at this and say, I'm just not sure. So even if your platform here works beautifully for drafting laws, it's not going to work in the US because we don't pass laws anymore. We, we, our Congress passed 200 laws the last session, and they were mostly like the names of post offices. You know, we don't actually pass meaningful legislation at this point. So I have no confidence that that's a way to make change. But there's other ways to make change. You can make change by shaping social norms, right? We've had a huge change in the United States around gay marriage. It's completely transformed in 10 years. My sister is a lesbian. When she was graduating from college, she assumed she would never be able to get married. Five years ago, she got married in Vermont. Last year, she got divorced in Massachusetts. It's sad, but at least it's her legal right to do so. It's a total change, but it was a change of values. And a lot of the work that people do right now is trying to change values. A lot of the work that people try to do these days is try to make change through the markets. Right? We can't get the US to sign climate treaties. We can't get a cap on emissions. But Elon Musk is making a Tesla. And it's an electric car. And it's beautiful. And if it gets cheap, maybe you actually have some real change there. We have a lot of people who are trying to make change through code. You may have noticed our country has some issues with privacy. Uh, we seem to want to know something about what's going on in other people's lives, not to mention our own lives. President Obama is not going to do anything about it. He's made it very clear. But friends of mine who write good cryptography software are finding ways to change. So the first thing that happens in mistrust is you look for other paths to change. You look for other ways that you can build change in a society. And those paths of norms, of code, of markets, those are all very powerful paths. The second thing you do is because you're mistrustful of institutions, you look for ways to build systems that don't become institutions. 
So think about things like mesh networks, right? This is a big obsession of people in the tech community, people who really care about these things, who care about these issues of decentralization. Mesh networks don't work very well, but we love them. And the reason we love them is no single person is in control of them. They're highly decentralized. You don't rely on an internet service provider. You're relying on yourself and on other groups of people, and you're relying on the technology to make it work. Let's look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not yet something that I'm ready to turn over my money to, but one of the reasons people are so excited about it is it doesn't mean relying on a central bank. It doesn't mean relying on a government to manage an economy. It means relying on a distributed system in one fashion or another. There is incredible enthusiasm in this technology community for these decentralized systems because they're another way to respond to institutions and our mistrust of institutions. The trick with it is it's very, very hard to build things that are decentralized and as reliable as institutions, as we found out from Mt. Gox with Bitcoin, as we found out with anyone who's tried to turn over their internet service to something like phone, it's very hard to get these things to scale. Here's the third thing that people do when they're driven by mistrust, but they want to channel it positively. They become very powerful monitors. This was the whole rise of blogging, this whole idea that everyone was going to become a newspaper, or everyone was going to become a publisher, this was a chance for us to become that fourth estate, that group that was looking and trying to make sure that government did the right job. And one of the interesting things is that we're getting better and better tools for doing this. So I want to close my remarks by talking about something that I'm trying to do right now in Brazil around this idea that I'm exploring that I'm calling monitorial citizenship. So if this whole problem is, if we are all individually and collectively mistrustful, how do we avoid dropping out of democracy? And what I want to encourage people to do is to find a way to do this, whether this is starting a socially responsible business, whether this is figuring out how to make decentralized networks work, or whether it's taking on monitoring as a central part of your identity. So I stood up to talk about this idea of monitoring, finding a way to look at the promises an institution makes, whether it's a government, whether it's a university, to try to publish those promises, to try to track them, and to try to hold people responsible. I gave this in a talk at the MIT Media Lab. And this crazy man comes up to me just after I get off stage, he's got a gray beard and gray hair, and he grabs me and he says, you have to come to Sao Paulo. Now the man is Odette Grish, uh, founder of the World Social Forum, runs Reynosa Sao Paulo, has been helping Mayor Hadaj with this Programa Nas Metas, so this set of goals that have been set up for the city. Sao Paulo, when Hadaj got elected, published a 200-page book with the goals for the city, elected 1,100 citizen representatives to say, are you living up to these goals, but gave no method for how those people would monitor them. So we came in and we designed something very simple. It's a very simple tool. You take your phone, you have a community meeting, and you decide, what do we want to monitor? I'm a parent. I've got a five-year-old son. Parquinhos, playgrounds, are very important to me. So I want to map all the playgrounds around. I want to find out, are they safe? I want to know, are they maintained? I want to know if someone's selling drugs there. I want to know whether I can let my kid play there. I can design a survey and give it out to everybody else in my neighborhood. And we can go out and monitor those playgrounds in the neighborhood. We can collect the data. We can have an open data set under CC0. We can pull the data tables out of it. We can pull maps out of it. We can make a video showing the photos that we've taken of the various different playgrounds. So we can go to the government and say, look, you have a real problem. You promised us a safe place to play. Look at these photos that we have from this. We released this tool in Sao Paulo two weeks ago. 
And we've been invited into seven other cities to start doing workshops around this. There's a huge appetite for this. And whether this project succeeds or fails, this larger idea that one of the things you can ask people to do to channel, to harness that mistrust, is to become engaged critics. This is a critical move at this moment in time. So what I want you to take away from this and what I want to hear Yvonne's reaction to is I agree that we're at this moment of very high mistrust, but I think mistrust doesn't have to be corrosive. I think if we channel mistrust, it could become one of our most important civic assets. I think we could channel it into making change through non-governmental means. I think we can channel it into monitoring governments aggressively. And I think we can channel it into building decentralized systems. And I think if we get good at doing that, it becomes an asset, not a problem. great presentation so first I really ask you not to buy and to read my book because the reading which you heard is much more interesting than the book <laughs> so then you're basically going to spoil the experience but I do believe that because it was really interesting I'll try to to tell you where my questions come from because unlike Ethan I'm not sure that I have much answers but my idea is if we're coming with the wrong questions the answers doesn't matter Listen, certain things in which we strongly believe these days. One is that transparency empowers people. But if you look historically, one of the major achievements of empowering people was the secret belt, which means that probably secrecy empowers, not transparency. So why I'm saying all this? Because we are trying to, and mistrust is very important for democracy. Uh, and then two different types of mistrust. What's, what is mistrust based on mistrust in institutions? What people call liberal mistrust. And the answer to this is basically to try to have this check and balance system in which you're not going to give the whole power to the government, but you're going to have the judicial system in charge. We, on a different level, we totally do not trust those who pretend to represent us. And this is becoming like an epidemic. It's not simply that you don't trust those who are in parliament. People less and less trust anybody who's going to be in parliament. Just in order to tell you, because Bulgaria is one of the great examples of a classical radical demonstration of this. In 2013, the government that was elected came with a very kind of creative decision. They decided to make the head of the Bulgarian security agency a 34-year guy whose mother is controlling 70% of the Bulgarian media. He himself was investigated for corruption four times. And the only thing about him what we know is that it was totally corrupt. And 100,000 people ended on the street protesting. The guy resigned. The people on the street said, we want the government to go. For 300 days, they protested. There was a days with 10,000, there were days with 1,000. But for all these 300 days, not a single political speech was made. They did not allow any of the political leaders to join the protests. Because the major story was, if you allow the politicians to speak, they're going to lie to you. So if you don't want to be lied to, you should be silent. And you have for 300 days, people basically walking. Why I'm saying this? The problem with mistrust is that, and this is my major argument, there are certain levels to which mistrust empowers. And there are certain levels in which mistrust starts to disempower citizens. Because we're in a strange situation. If you talk to the governments, they are also not happy. Moises Naim wrote a book in which he said, it was never easier to get power, to lose power, but it was never more difficult to govern. So the government said, we cannot govern anymore. We have the market which are constraining you. You have the people on the street all the time. Everybody's pushing for this and that. We simply cannot deliver. Because at the first moment we decided to do something, there is some interest group, positive or negative, who comes and said, you cannot do it. And everybody speaks on behalf of society as a whole. So as a result of it, governments these days started a different game. If before they're pretending how strong they are, now you have a competition in impotence. 
the government is using all their power to tell the people what they cannot do. These days, basically, governments are mainly in the business to train, to tell you that nothing depends on them. They cannot do this because of the jury, that's because of the court, they cannot do this because of the market, in our case you cannot do it because of the European Union. But the problem is if you're voting for people who can do nothing, why are you voting for them at all? And in my view, this is a very important change of the perspective. Before the governments are always trying to pretend that they can do more than they could. Now they understood that if you manage to convince people that you cannot deliver. Basically, you cannot be blamed in anything. Uh, and in places like Bosnia, one of the interesting stories, they have also mass protests of their own. The major decision to be taken was where to protest. On which level the decision is taken. I do believe that this kind of a diffusion and disappearance of power is a very interesting story. Because on the side of the citizens, we are also in a strange position. On one level, at least in our countries, we are freer than before. We have more rights than before. But I don't have the feeling that I have more power than before. Because in the traditional democracy of 30 years ago, part of the power was coming that you're a voter, but also you're a soldier, and also you have been a worker. So basically, if you stop to work, the government has a problem. If you decided not to fight, the government has a problem. Now I'm a voter. <coughs> the workers are basically in China, so I don't believe working in our country. Soldiers are drones. And secondly, you cannot push the elites anywhere because at the moment when you say we're going to strike, they're saying, okay, we're moving to the next country. And they're taking basically the business with them. So from this point of view, I do believe that after the first 10 or 15 years, after 1989, people had the feeling that it was a liberation of the people. And now we have the feeling that it's liberation of the elites. Because basically they can go anywhere. So my story is what you're doing in this situation. Uh, and uh, this type of explosion of protests around the world is a very interesting example of this. In the last five years, there was more, in more than 70 countries in the world, there were mass political protests. Brazil being one of them, I mean, in 2013, and obviously now. Do you know what is strange about these countries? Some of these countries are rich, other poor. Some have been in recession, but by the way, when Brazil was protesting, they were not in recession then, and Turkey was not in recession. Some of these countries are democracies, but others, like Russia, were not. Why? Everywhere. And secondly, why the political parties and the trade unions, which normally have been organizing people on the streets, were not there anymore? Why these groups on the streets have been so heterogeneous, and they're making a very strong argument to show how heterogeneous they are? And here comes, well, basically my major argument is uh, I want to come. Something obviously very important is changing on the realm of politics. Many people very much went on technology as the explanation. I was in Argentina, I was talking to the net democracy people. But part of the problem of trying these changes to be seen simply as a technology change is covering a more, in my view, radical change. Listen, when before you see 100,000 people on the street, the first question was, who on the street? Are the communists on the street? Are the fascists on the street? Who's on the street? The revolution used to have a political names. Now see how we are basically calling all these revolutions that we watched. Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution. They have a company name. They have a company names because when people are on the street, you don't have the feeling that you know what kind of political objective they're for. Of course, they don't trust the government who is there. But exactly the way they stand, what do you expect from this to happen, why they are together, this is a kind of question which basically has uh, disappeared. When I talked to the net democracy people, they said, we have this great platform, we want to deliberate, we created a party, and what we promised to the people was that after this deliberation, people are going to vote, and the majority vote is going to be represented uh, in the parliament. But do you want to be? the member of parliament for a party which only kind of idea is that they want to represent the majority nevertheless of the majority is. Is it not strange? Probably there are certain things about which you care very much. Probably for you, this is things on which you are not ready to make a compromise. 
If you're simply ready to support the majority and the way it is going to be expressed, why are you going to vote at all? Stay, don't vote, they are majorities, and you can follow what they're doing. So my most important question always to the technology focus idea of how democracy works is the very idea that technology in itself is changing politics. And you know, for example, in places like Iceland, the idea was it's enough to outsource the constitution writing, and we're going to have a different constitution. It's not going to happen, because first of all, there are not many people who are ready to be part of this process. To be honest, the people who are ready to do it are also very specific type of people. So you're representing certain groups which are better educated, much more familiar with this type of uh, tools. But some of the groups which normally are also the biggest losers out of the traditional politics are going to be a loser again. And in a way, they're going to be a loser in a big uh, And thirdly, which I find also even more important is this technology side. Uh, technology plays a role, but many people use technology as the way not to talk about political issues. We said for us it's important people to be represented. But listen, people does not have views which are embedded in them kind of on an atomic way. People are talking, people are exchanging, people are persuading each other. Uh, and the way basically what is good about democracy is that probably we're not equally handsome. In my case, it's obvious that I'm less handsome than many of you. Uh, and we are, we are all intelligent, but our experiences are equally valuable. This was very important about democracy. My experience and your experience are equally valuable. This is slightly disappearing. And I do believe here is the problem with all these type of exercises. How are you using technology in the way, not simply to say we can work without institutions, but in a certain way to try to see, listen, we can probably change the way the institution function. Because what politicians are doing, and politicians are not stupid people. You can believe that they are corrupt and it's true. But anybody who believes that politicians are stupid people are not getting it. They're simply intelligent in a very specific way, which very much works for them. For example, uh, how they're using technology. If you talk about the latest campaigns in the United States, what they discover through the big data is that it's not needed anymore to try to persuade anybody anything anymore. You are not interested in the center anymore. What I know on the basis of the big data is if I know what kind of car you are buying, what kind of a TV show you are watching, and if I know that you are not voting, I will know that if you decided to vote for whom you are going to vote. So in a certain way, I'm targeting you, and the only idea of electoral politics these days is not to convince those who disagree with me, but basically to mobilize those who are not voting, but whom I know that if I can bring them to the electoral box, I'm going to vote the way I expect. This was the Obama campaign. In a certain way, what changed, and this is my most important idea, for me the biggest protagonist of democratic politics is the guy who can change his opinion on the base of argument. The guy who can change his opinion <coughs> is the person. If there is going to be the monument of democracy, this is not a guy who died for democracy, but the guy who changed his opinion on the base of the argument. Because this is allowing us to get this compromise that allows us to go to now, with the idea of mistrust is good, and I, I, I do believe what you're saying is very powerful and creative, my only objection is going to be like this. We should not fall in love with mistrust. Because the Bulgarian example was a critical story. When you don't trust anybody, the government is the biggest winner. And by the way, the governments learn it very quickly. In Bulgaria, the government, when they went on television, they were not saying anymore, trust us, because it was also ridiculous. The major story was, don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody. But when you don't trust anybody, the status quo is going to be reproduced. Probably it's not going to be re-legitimized, but it is going to be reproduced. And in my view is how we can trust gov mistrust governments while trusting other people. And for this, you need a project. And for me, for this, you need a normal political project, which could be wrong, which could be, but it should look like an alternative. It does not need to be a political party. But you should share a dream. It's not enough to share mistrust. Uh, and this is where I do believe part of the weaknesses of some of the new monitoring kind of movements are coming from. They do believe 
that monitoring is enough. Listen, you can monitor people. You can dismiss people who are not performing. But if you cannot come with a system that produces collective dreams, you're not going to change society. So this is where I'll stop. So I, I, I mentioned that there really was a debate here. And, and I think you see it, right? So, so let me call out two things, right? We have a debate here about what you do with mistrust in society. Yvonne will tell you at the end of the day, if you don't have a big vision, if you don't have some way to have a dream, we are losing all the potential of democracy. I'm going to tell you, I actually think we have some good ways to channel this mistrust, that we can get better at trying to figure out how we reform our institutions, possibly in part because I'm not sure I have the big dream to answer your question. But let me say, there's another debate in all of this that we're both on the same side of, which is, are people more mistrustful? Are people losing faith in institutions? Are people losing faith in some of the methods that some people in this room are working on? And you should argue with us on that, as well as arguing about what we're arguing about here. So, Pedro? Uh, I can do that. Uh, so, and we can share. Why don't, why don't we roll one? Yes, we'll I'll do that. And just, uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm Pedro Abrombay. I work at the Open Society Foundations, where uh, they are both part of the Global Board, so they're kind of my bosses. <laughs> uh, <too>. Only. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and also, uh, there's this. Uh, I mean, Brazilians are in general more optimistic. There is Mayakovsky poem uh, that say. Some, somewhere in a distant place, maybe in Brazil, there's a happy man. So, <laughs> uh, so the, the, I'll, I'll take the point on, on me stressed and be, be, be use uh, Ethan's point to be more optimistic. That is, um, it is possible to build a dream around mistrust. And 19th century institutions, or 18th, but, are institutions of mistrust, right? Parliament is an institution of mistrust. The judicial review is, or is an institution of mistrust. And 19th century was built, and the dream of liberalism was built out of institutional of mistrust. And the, and, the, and the 20th century was trying to, to, to backfire that, in a way, right? Uh, socialism experiences, but also uh, social democracy is this, how can the executive branch, you know, push against this mistrust institution to try to build something with the state, right? If mistrust is such an important value, again, it's trying to redefine what are the mistrust institutions for the 20th century. They're not based on checks and balances that is based on industrial revolution, right? Institution and the way to represent it. And, but what are the institutions of mistrust that can be built for the 21st century, and, my, and I think we don't know. I mean, I would like to, I'd love to hear the, the end, but, but I think that one of the points that we have here is we have big. I mean, 70 people, 70 country, mass mobilization in those countries, and I've worked in different agendas, and always we had the agendas, one or many, and we didn't have mobilization. This is the first time I'm seeing a mobilization that doesn't have an agenda. <laughs> yeah, right? it's kind of a Pirandello. So I think, but maybe that the point is we should try to to recognize the mistrust, recognize this is the dream of this society, and think about the agenda on the uh, on institutions of mistrust. Right? Can I make a point because it's very important. The problem is, should politicians anymore hope that they could be trusted? Not the politicians now, but if somebody wants, are you ready to run for any electoral office? if you believe that people are never going to trust you. Because part of the problem with the monitoring politics is that we're starting to treat people like criminals and you end up with criminals in politics. For example, part of the story is that there's a certain type of a shared experiences and this is why words are different on the basis, for example, people who take risks. We have a mistrust in institutions but in many countries you start to have a trust in certain political leaders. Charismatic leaders are on rights. And I'm talking about democratic countries. Why? Because obviously it's much easier to trust a concrete person than party and so on. But this is also 
showing that demand for trust is very strong in politics. And this play between mistrust and trust for me is very important. Democracy could be organization of mistrust, but only in societies which are very kind of happy in the way they are, and the most important is to prevent bad things to happen. But if you want to change society in a major way, distrust is not going to be enough. So, I, Pedro, I love what you had to say about mobilization without agenda, right? Because I think in many ways this does describe a, a lot of what protest has looked like. Um, I, I'm trying to understand, one of my students is writing about uh, the 2013 protests in Sao Paulo. And she keeps telling me, it's not about the bus fare. And I keep saying, so what was it about? And she keeps saying, it wasn't about the bus fare. And I said, OK, I get it. You know, what is, what is it about? Well, so it's about corruption. It's about better public services for the working middle class. It's about, there were lots of, you have to just look at the signs they were carrying. So, so allow me to maybe finish my point before jumping in. Um, what we're seeing in a lot of protest movements these days is these deeply heterogeneous agendas where you have people holding signs for 50 different things and they're able to march together because they're marching against. The problem with these movements, they're very, very big. You can build them very, very quickly, but they're very, very fragile. So the person who's doing the best work on this is Zainab Tufeshi. She's a, a Turkish social scientist. And she looked at the, the Gezi Park protests. The Gezi Park protests are crazy. Because you look at them, and you've got these guys wearing all black. They're ultra-nationalist, ultra-religious Turks. And then next to them are guys in pink tights dancing for gay rights. And the motto of, of the movement um, is, is, I think it's Gel Merit, it's, it's you come to. You know, no matter what you're upset about, you can come and be upset about it with us. Now the problem with this is, if you roll back 20 years, it was a big deal to get 50,000 people in the streets. And you had to spend a lot of time agreeing on what you were for and what you were against. Now it's actually very easy to get 50,000 people in the streets. And when you ask them what they're for or against, you can't find out whether it's the bus fare or whether it's corruption or whether it's you know, cuts in education because there isn't a single coherent agenda. You've got mobilization without that agenda. And it's very, very hard to make change with those movements right now. So part of what I'm sort of concerned about in all of this is We've learned to do certain things with these new technologies. We've learned how to do it to market a candidate. We've learned to do it in my country to raise amazing amounts of money. We're great at doing that with new technology. We're really, really good at be bringing people out into the streets. But we're crap at deliberation at this point. And I'm not sure that, that joint legislative authoring is going to be enough to actually sort of move us in the right direction. And whether the little suggestions I have or whether Yvonne's hope for a big vision, that's, I think, what we're getting at. Thank you. This is a fascinating discussion. I'm David Smiley. I'm a consultant with the uh, Latin America program. I'm, I'm also a social scientist, and so this is a, an issue that's very dear to me. And before I studied politics, I studied religion. So, uh, one thing, and, and charismatic religion, religious change, religious conversion. And so, the idea that um, uh, distrust would prevent dreams, I think, is, it, to me, it, it's exactly the opposite. I think the one, the grounds that have, have produced the most dreams, whether it be religious or political, historically, is precisely the moments of great distrust. Because I think they come in times when there's, there's a lot of deception with established authorities. And so I think, you know, whether, whether you look at the Old Testament prophets or you look at Martin Luther King or Obama, they come in moments in which people are very disillusioned with authorities. And so I think, you know, uh, uh, distrust is actually a, a, a quite positive grounds for, for political change. I think in general, I haven't I haven't read the book, but I think you know if you if you look at the data and the, the kind of polls that ask about trust, 
it, usually it's a trust of particular institutions in societies, and even if it's about institutions in general, the way a respondent actually understands these questions is usually with reference to a particular society. And so I think the fact that people distrust in particular institutions or, or in the current time institutions does not mean that they are being distrusted in all institutions. It doesn't mean that they can't be, that, that they have to be atomized and uh, can't be oriented into creating new institutions and new forms of, of uh, human uh, integration and cooperation. Uh, I'm going to take a few more after that, so that's a good idea. I have one there and then here. Uh, in fact, I have two questions. One for Ivan. For Ivan, is in your book, uh, Democracy Disrupt, do you say that the, 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 the people that were demonstrating in, until 2013, they didn't want to get to power? And I would like you to analyze the case of Greece. In the case of Podemos in this light, how this change your... Um, and the other question is, I think people are very mistrustful about deliberation in the internet, online. For instance, there was a case in, in Rio, uh, there was an uh, online... Uh, uh, people put their signatures online to try to impeach the president of the journalist union. But then they uh, were an assembly, and effectively the people who went there didn't want to impeach the president. So much less people went there for the impeachment they, they, than the people that signed. So it's very easy to deliberate on the internet, but it's very difficult in our time when people work a lot, including because of the internet to be present and deliberate in, over a subject of interest in a democracy. So I'd like Ethan to comment on that as well. One more. That's a big deal. Yeah. Question short. I'm happy you're not coming. <coughs> uh, Fernand Braudel Institute of World Economics. Uh, uh, one of the prime functions uh, in a political system is inter-segregation. And you described uh, the, uh, you know, a way to interest, aggregate interest on a small scale in terms of playgrounds, for example. But, I mean, if we look at the, the demonstrations here in Brazil, and you look at, uh, you know, Castell's book on networks of outrage and, and hope, um, here in Brazil, I, I'm quite sure that the majority of those people were against corruption in favor of transparency and for better public services, and uh, one can add a bunch of things, but I, you know, if you were to take polls, maybe that's part of the trick, I mean, use some of these tools. They're all out there on Facebook and Twitter. We could run some of these simple polls to see how to aggregate interest, but I think the real thing is you're never going to, you know, you're against political parties, but it's hard to change the system until you can <laughs> form some sort of party. Now, Marina, tried here, but then it didn't get past stage one. Um, but I think, in the end, if you don't have some sort of party, you'll never be able to take power and really make the changes. So how do you aggregate interest with these tools? Oh, easy questions. Very easy. <laughs> so, look, a lot of the questions that, that are being put in my direction are, are very much around this question of aggregating interest, what we would call in my field of communication, setting agenda. What is it that we're actually going to talk about? In many ways, these get to this question of deliberation. How do you have a bunch of people decide that they're going to work together on something? And you're right to point out that in the example that I'm giving, a small group of people get together and say, what do we want to work on today? We'll work on something else tomorrow. But it's much, much harder when you try to do this at a very large scale. Certainly this is one of the histories of what political parties have been for. But again, in the trends that I'm looking at, trust in parties is going way, way, way down. So a lot of what people are trying to solve in contemporary politics is the deliberation problem. So deliberation online is really hard. We're starting to find certain things about online behavior 
One is that outrage spreads far faster than anything else online. And so this moment of being able to say, we're really angry, we have to do something, that's a very powerful call online. The conversation about what we're actually going to do is a much harder conversation to have. The medium doesn't seem to deal very well with it. Many of the aspects of how the medium works, let it get captured by the people who have the loudest voice, have the most time, have the most passion. In a room full of people, we're pretty good at reading each other and taking turns and shutting up somebody who's dominating the discussion. We don't do it online. We're very, very bad at it. The interesting thing is many of the ways that we come up with to solve these problems have been suggested as much as 100 years before as ways to try to solve the deliberation problem. Modern polling gets invented by George Gallup specifically to go after the question you're talking about. Can we, well, so much, much earlier than any of the technical stuff, if you have a representative in Congress, will he do a better job if he can survey constituents and find out what they believe? All of this sort of gets us to this fundamental question. Representative democracy is about putting our trust in a small number of people to have a conversation and change their minds about where we should go. I had a student come to me recently. She had a brilliant idea. She was so excited about it. The idea was this. We would vote online on any issue we cared about, and we would all agree that we would put our votes behind a candidate who would do exactly what we said. And I looked at this and I said, you know, you can't do that in American democracy. The entire point of having a representative democracy is that you should be able to go into that room and have someone change your mind. So trying to figure out how we can build a space where people can change each other's minds, that's really the challenge moving forward. I agree, it might be a new form of political party. I don't know that we're gonna do it very well with the internet as it works right now because right now we really seem to push people towards behaviors that make it very, very hard for people to change their minds. It makes it much easier to say no than to say you persuaded me. Thank you very much. A very interesting question. Let's start with, when I was young, I, I read the science fiction short story, which was Romania. 1970s, and it was telling the story of a society in which, they, after they elect their president, they embedded a bomb <laughs> in his body. And every citizen has a device, mobile phone, so after every decision of the president, people say yes or no. If three times the no are more than yes, he explodes. <laughs> uh, and I thought that many people, when they talk about direct democracy, the idea is on every decision they want to be the majority to decide. But imagine that every time when you have a decision, it's going to be based on the majorities that are not connected. You don't have this articulation. Why I'm saying this? Your question about Podemos and series is a great question. If you go in the beginning in the Indignados, the Indignados are making several very simple but powerful points. They said, we're not here to change the government, we're here to change the politics. So we don't want simply to be the next government, we want basically to change the way politics is experienced. So first they said, we are totally liberalist movement. Uh, secondly, basically, it's much more about what is happening on the street, what is changing, this is the protest experience that matters, and this is how we're going to change Spain. This is not simply because we're going to vote this way or the other way. The problem is that Podemos, which is an extremely interesting political project, used the energy of the protests, but it's a different project. In a certain way, with huge sympathy, but it is a very old left, highly centralized, with a very strong agenda. By the way, this is a Latin American party. This is why for the Europeans it's very difficult to get them, uh, because there are five professors in political science that made the party. 
which basically controlled the party to a great extent. It's highly charismatic to the extent that what started as leaderless movements, you end up with a ballot in which you have the face of the leader. And their experience basically was based much more, not so much Venezuela as they're saying, but uh, uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. So this is a classical Ernesto Lacroix story, which will try to be the hegemonic project. They said the idea of the politics is to construct the notion of the people in the way that works for the progressive side. Why I'm saying that this is different? Part of the problem of the protests in the way I see them is that they are not ready to recognize different social groups and interests. The idea is that if we're discussing, we're discussing simply as civic-minded individuals, and at the end of the day, we're going basically to end up with something which is a public interest. Listen, 50 years ago, the definition of politics was who gets what, when, and how. So from this point of view, there are always going to be different interests. There does not need to be kind of a class type of wars and so on. But the very idea of reducing the politics simply to the rational discussion between an abstract individuals is what makes people to go on the street. Because one of the problems with the electoral politics is that there is one important thing that is never represented in elections, and this is special. Listen, me who cares a lot about certain issue, and the other person who does not, both of us has one vote. How I'm going to make known to the government that I cannot stand them anymore? Vote is not enough. You want to show that for you this is extremely important. And this is why you're on the street, this is why you're ready to risk this and that. I do believe this is very important because in politics it's also important what you're not representing, not simply what you're representing. And here comes my last point on deliberation. Deliberation is a very important thing, but deliberation works when you have people with different views that deliberate, with different interests. Social psychologists have shown, and Cass Sustain has this uh, very much in his book on group polarization, that if you have like-minded people starting to discuss a topic and starting to discuss actively and deliberate, you're ending up on a very extreme position. The problem with deliberation in this type of a platforms and forums is because it's self-selecting. It's me who decides where to go. It's me who decides who's going to talk. You always go to talk with two types of people, either those who think like you, and then you basically go on extreme, or normally people are also very much interested to people who are on a totally different views, just to be sure that they're idiots. So you can basically also, uh, the interesting story about deliberation, and this is why the parliament is kind of a much more interesting example, is because you have this very controlled environment of deliberation. I'm saying this and I want to basically share an experience. Some years ago, because our center in Sofia was very much interested in being part of every experiment which was around, we went with Stanford and Fishkin on this deliberative polls. Deliberative poll is a very interesting technique, very artificial as you're going to get it, but it's like this. You're taking an issue, for example, crime. You're making a representative survey on policy issues, not on value issues. What should be done, this and that, and people are responding. Normally, as you know, the representative sample is around 1,000 people. On the base of the results, you're getting a group of 300 representing the old variety, but also demography of the answers. You're bringing them for two days, and you're allowing them to discuss with experts between themselves in small groups. They're getting all the materials, which basically normally politicians are going to get. The idea was that if we're electing our parliaments through voto and not through elections, these people could be the representatives. And the results are very optimistic. People are ready to change their opinion, they're ready to change their opinion. When you're selecting them like this, they start to understand that their opinion matters a lot. The first thing that you're telling them during the experiment is, now you are the parliament. And they start to become much more responsible. They start to read in a totally different way all these materials. So they start to behave like representatives. The most difficult is to get the person who knows that there are 10 million like him, okay, it's 100 million to believe 
that it's his opinion and his decision that decides. I believe this is the biggest problem with deliberation, and this is why representative democracy, with all these shortcomings, has certain type of uh, inherited advantages that we should not dismiss. Very good. Uh, before I take a few other questions, you mentioned the effort we are doing here to build a platform for political participation. So we are launching this project called uh, Plataforma Brasil. .org.br uh, that will be launched on March 4th. We thank Open Society for the support. March, May 4th, I'm sorry. I got from the airport today and completely jet lagged, so you'll excuse me for that. Uh, it's important to mention, Ethan, that and if, I was speaking with Ivan before. I believe uh, trying to get any form of representation online with technology is kind of pointless. So representative democracy is not a goal in using technology. What you can achieve, and is what we achieved, for instance, with the Marco Civil Bill discussions in Brazil, is building some sort of ideal form of debate uh, in which everyone has their experiences, as you described, valued equally, so that you can have a channel for empirical data, you can have a channel for qualified debate, for the experts, for the private sector, for the government, for the NGOs, for the academia, so that it will enrich public policy making. So our goal is not only legislative crafting, but also policy making crafting, in which you have problems, and that from the, uh, the point of view of the design of the platform, we will solve problems that can be uh, turned into questions. So the limitation, the restraint on the platform is that you have to formulate a question and then the platform can answer, uh, help you to answer that. So this is what we're doing at uh, platformabrasil.org.br. We are not ambitious to get any sort of representative democracy through the platform, but we want to have a channel that can inform policy making through this open participatory discussion. So I'm hugely excited to see where it goes. I, I want to throw out sort of two cautions. The, the first caution, Ivan makes the point that voting is very bad at harnessing passion, right? Ivan is very, very passionate about a candidate. I couldn't really care less, but I'm going to vote because it's my duty. We each get one vote. The internet and participation online is the complete opposite. If I have a lot of passion, I have a lot of time, I have a lot of energy, I have a lot of anger, not only do I get a thousand votes, but I can often chase other people out of the space. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to figure out how to structure these spaces with some of these real world rules. We've used things in building tools for class discussion where we allow everyone the same amount of time for comment, and you get one comment. And that's all you get for 24 hours, so that you prevent the person who would spend 20 hours on the system, and you try to get into, into a different rule set. So thinking about what's the rule set that isn't one person, one vote, and that isn't one person with passion gets a thousand votes. What's the balance would be critically important. The second problem, and this is one where we may just disagree, and this may be Brazilian optimism versus, at the moment, American citizens. He's becoming more Bulgarian. I'm becoming more Bulgarian by the day. I am less excited about this at the national level in the US, because I'm just not confident that these guys are going to do anything. Um, it's not even that I'm not confident that I can influence them. I'm simply in my own political process not confident that you can do anything at all. And so when my ambitions look very small, when they look at the level of the city, this is a big trend in the US right now. People are writing books that say things like, mayors are the new president. And what you should read that to be is no one is confident that anyone can fix politics at the national level. The hope is you might be able to have meaningful participation 
at that very local level. And that's why I'm aiming my efforts there. And what I would say is, if you find you're having resistance at the national level, you know, you have a president who doesn't have a lot of confidence in the moment, it's going to be very hard for her to get anything to do, get done. Moving to that city level may actually be a very powerful way to go with the activity. Very good. Um, I'm going to open for the last round of questions. So uh, let's take a few. Hi, I'm Julia Michaels, and I'm a blogger. I blog about the transformation of Rio here. And um, so, of course, I'm very concerned about one thing we hadn't talked very much about, which is information and where people get it. And here in Brazil, um, we basically have a monopoly which paints a certain reality. And then a lot of pulverized sources and a lot of uncertainty about where the media is going. And I just wanted to bring that up and see what you have to say. Should we take a couple questions? Yes, yes. Anyone else? Let me do the following. Oops, sorry for that. Can I pass the microphone, please? Hello, uh, Dan Arnado from the University of Washington. Um, so, you're both kind of touching on the issue a little bit, um, and I find, I do research on internet governance as well, um, that net neutrality in particular has become an issue that really does mobilize people in different contexts. And we're seeing right now in India, for instance, there's a huge movement going on that's forced internet.org to lose partners with the media and with different internet applications. And then in the US, you saw an incredible period where the FCC received over a million comments, broke the website, did all sorts of crazy things. And I would include the Marcus Bill process in that, and now ongoing and implementation, talking about net neutrality with the, with the regulators and moving forward. You've actually seen how public input has had a, a pretty big impact in all those cases, and there's definitely a lot of others, but specifically around this issue of network neutrality. And I would, I would argue that because it extends some democratic concepts into the, the governance of the internet, I think that also plays to it. So I just wanted to get your take on how that interplay works in, in your perspective. Should I start? So, so let me start with the net neutrality question. And um, let me point out that the stories on net neutrality are a good story on the one hand and a somewhat troubling story on the other hand. So the good story is there are amazing examples of citizen participation and actually citizen leadership. So we've done two big papers on what's happened around network neutrality and around Sopa Pipa. And what's been very exciting in the US is that these are not movements led by political parties. These are not movements led by large NGOs. There was a hypothesis that Google was sort of leading these movements. We were able to demonstrate that that really wasn't the case. It was mostly small groups led by one or two individuals who became very knowledgeable about the subject, used online tools to organize. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. These are the issues that geeks care the most about. And so you're taking an issue where you are absolutely the most likely to get really good online participation. And we're now sort of claiming them as success, and I would say that's true for Marco Civil as well. It's great, now the question is, can we do this around tax policy? Can we do this around zoning? Can we do this around something that is significantly less close to the hearts of some of the people who are the most sophisticated users of these tools? And it's an open question. So it's very, very promising, but given the focus of it, there's also a question around it. I'm thrilled to get a question about media within this. And I would say in many ways, what the tool I'm talking about is really doing is it's doing crowdsourced alternative reporting. So what we really hoped for out of the rise of blogs, which happened again you know, 10 years ago, was this notion that there might be viable alternative media online. 
And it's gone in very different directions in different countries. If you're in a country like Vietnam, where there's absolute media crackdown, there's a very viable alternative media on online media. And it's very dangerous to be writing in that media, but it's powerful, it's important, and it's very much worth defending. In the US, where for all the problems we have, our media is quite open, what happened was all those bloggers just got subsumed into mainstream media. No one blogs anymore because they write for all the different publications. Even for me, I've been blogging since 2002, now I mostly write for Harper's. Uh, so, you know, it's an interesting question in Brazil where you have media that is open but extremely concentrated. And this is an area where we're not quite sure how it's going to play out. The problem is not just having a place to speak. The problem is actually getting somebody to listen. And this is one of the places we're trying to figure out how to mobilize a group of people to jointly report on something already gives you more strength than being that lone voice in the wilderness. It also gives the possibility of going to something like Globo and essentially saying, look, we've done the work. Here's a story with thousands of points of data in it. And by the way, this story is going to have thousands of readers because they've gone out and claimed those data points and they care about this. It does end up being a very interesting sort of win-win for those large media outlets. And that's why we think it might actually work with them. But I think this larger question of how we take advantage of building an alternative media space with these platforms has to be one of this question of how do we build audiences? How do we build attention? And it's got to be something about coordinating and trying to figure out how we listen to one another. It gets us again to these questions of cooperation, agenda setting, coalition building, deliberation. How do we decide that the issues you care about are compatible with another set of issues so we build an audience for them? Thank you very much, because it's uh, my last intervention. Let's start with a very nice book on trust that was done by Italian sociologists who made the empirical study, and the study is the following. There were, two, there were then two cities in the world where we have a very high level of a taxi drivers being killed, New York and Belfast. So he basically decided to try to understand how the taxi drivers decided whom to trust to get on the taxi and whom not to get. And of course, when basically they go to New York, the taxi drivers are going to be most scared, 60, 70 year old black boys looking big on drugs. In Belfast, they were much more scared by 20, 21 year old, totally sober, very well kind of cut hairs with a political commitment uh, in their eyes. Trust and mistrust is something which is very contextual. And from this point of view, for me, the basic problem with information is, and this is why I have my also questions about transparency paradigm. Transparency paradigm is very powerful. It's much better to know than not to know. Uh, but there is this illusion that if people know the whole facts, they're going to end up on the same position. This is not true. People have different ideological biases, interests, identities. Uh, and as a result of it, what is changing public opinion quite often is not the new information, but somebody who takes the risk to say something that everybody knows but nobody dares to say. I'm saying this because the whole problem with the online politics is that the risk level is very low. While in politics, normally trust is based on taking risks. In politics, biography matters. You're trusting certain people not because of what they're telling you, and even not only on the basis of their competence, because, but because you look at their lives. And it's not by accident that, for example, people that have been in prison or here and there, you believe that who could be ready to sacrifice something, you're treating them differently. Part of the problem with this type of a deliberative democracy, which is reduced simply to arguments, is to tell you, listen, biography doesn't matter. It's about competence. 
it's about basic positions. In theory, it works. But in practice, institutions are also people, especially institutions for which you vote. And this is why, basically, when somebody said, trust me because of this and this and this, it's normally based on a certain type of a risk that he's taking. And this is why I do believe it's very difficult uh, for the online politics to capture the imagination outside of a small group of a very highly educated, realistically motivated people because it's a very low risk environment. The simple story is, if you're not ready, if not to die, but to lose something big on this, why should I trust you that it really makes this is really important for you. And I do believe this is quite interesting, and this is also changing politics a lot. If you see when is the trust in political parties, institutions, hires, normally after the wars. Because normally you can see all these politicians and others referring to their military experience and saying, listen, I was your leader during the war. You know that you can trust me. And, and I do believe this type of a this appearance of experience. Now we have these highly charismatic politicians. Clinton was the greatest example. He's a magician. But the problem is that he's a magician because you don't have biographies anymore. And when you don't have a biography, the magic is the thing. So probably internet is part of this magic. Thank you very much. Uh, we're heading to the end of our fantastic panel. Before I ask you to join me and thank our panelists, I uh, just would like to point out that you should feel free to take those books over there with you. Uh, there is one uh, that covers a lot of what we've been discussing, the, published with Itaú Cultural and ITS. And this is a monthly event, so keep an eye on it. Uh, every month we have our barandas here. They're always free. We thank the people who have donated to ITS. We ask them to do uh, pay what you want, if you want. A lot of people don't want to pay anything, but a lot of people do. And we appreciate even like the small amounts that we've got. And uh, before I conclude, I'd like to invite you to go once again outside. We have beer, we have food, and we can continue this conversation in a more informal setting. So thank you so very much.